Thank you, Hugh. Uh, well, it's, it's great to be here in Glastonbury. I've been here a number of times, but this is my, my first conference here. Uh, the megalithomania, what a great idea for a conference. Um, tell you just briefly about myself. I'm, I was born in France, but my parents are Americans. I spent some years in France, then grew up in America. I, was, I grew up in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. I was a skier and later a mountain climber. I was always interested and loved to travel around the world. My parents liked to travel. And I was uh, just 18, 19. I was studying Chinese at the University of Montana. And I was able to go to Taiwan as an English teacher. That got me to Asia. I'd always wanted to go to Nepal and Tibet. I had, uh, technical climbing interested me as well as stuff in as well in uh, t t Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism. And like you guys, I've always been interested in unusual things, ancient history, and uh, Atlantis, Megalus, and some of the mysteries of the past. So with that said, uh, fasten your seatbelts, and let's go to the lost cities of South America. I always like to briefly introduce the whole concept of Atlantis. Atlantis is, uh, comes from the great uh, Greek historian Plato. Plato uh, talks about it being an Egyptian story. The Egyptians themselves tell Plato. They say, you Greeks don't even know your own history. Your, your country's a lot older than you even know. And then he tells them the story of Atlantis. The idea that Atlantis was somehow in the Atlantic, this is a, a sonar photograph that was taken by a robotic sub off of Cuba, 1998 supposedly of city streets, of pyramids, 2,000 feet below the Caribbean Ocean off the west part of Cuba. Also right around that area in the Bahamas is the famous Bimini Wall, a giant megaliths underwater, possibly uh, uh, man-made or, or maybe natural. There's over 200 known sunken cities in the Mediterranean including two cities that have been found off of Alexandria, 35 kilometers out into the Mediterranean. Mainstream archaeologists are telling us now that the oldest ruins in the world are on Malta and, and Gozo. And th these ruins here are supposedly the oldest known ruins. They're said to be at least 9,000 years old. We're talking 7,000 BC here, that we're getting towards the time of Atlantis. Atlantis being uh, 10,000 BC or so, according to Plato and the Egyptians. In Malta, you also have these, these cart tracks cut into stone. They're the same gauge as, as Roman uh, cart tracks were, and also British railways. They're, they must be five, six, seven, 9,000 years old, yeah. They go off cliffs. In Malta, they say that a giant wave hit Malta and wiped it out. There were pygmy elephants, pygmy uh, hippopotami, and other weird animals in Malta. There were, many of them were washed into this cave. Something hit Wal Malta, and it was wiped out, and the Mediterranean was filled in at that time. In the eastern Mediterranean, in uh, Lebanon, is the Baalbek Becca Valley, and there the largest known megaliths in the world are found. These are the, the giant uh, ashlers at Baalbek. Some of these weigh 1,000 tons, or 100,000 tons, I should say. It, there's the largest known blocks, that have, and they're still in the quarry. They really are, are huge, uh, larger than a railway car, say. We'll see some of this also in South America, just in a minute. Mainstream archaeologists have to explain how you're going to move a 1,000-ton block around. The, their explanation right now is that by using uh, small hourglass-type stones that are cut into small uh, cuttings in the block, then you build a giant cage around these huge blocks and you have to have lots of pulleys and, and things like that. And then you can move this block a, a few inches. 
and then you start all over again. This is allegedly uh, how they were moving megaliths, but you have to ask why? Why would they do something like this? Why are they trying to build in what would seem to be an extremely difficult way? This is uh, an old National Geographic painting of the building of the Parthenon in Athens. And what you see here, what's interesting, these are what are called keystone cuts and clamps. And in this case, they're T-shaped. You have different blocks of stone, and then you pour molten metals in here. We're going to be seeing more of that. If you go to Egypt, uh, there are supposedly pre-Egyptian ruins in Egypt, pre-dynastic, possibly from Atlantis, over 10,000 years old. This is the Osirion near Abydos. Giant blocks of granite. It's actually underwater for a while. The Egyptian government spent years pumping this out. They're still pumping it out, trying to get all the water out of it. Notice here, this is inside the Osirion. There's no uh, hieroglyphs or anything like that there. Notice here, a uh, curious notching of stones. Also, these little knobs and pillows, pillows type things that are on these stones. It's megalithic. All right, now we're in Cusco. We're in, we're in the capital, uh, the ancient Inca capital of Peru. The Incas are well known for building with this jigsaw type perfect construction. This is the famous stone of 12 angles, which is also in Cusco. Notice the knob here. This is on the label of the local beer, this stone right here. You can see uh, in streets in Cusco, different levels of building. Uh, much of it, particularly the bottom part, is megalithic, then other fine building stones on top. This is actually the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo. It, too, is a megalithic building that's built out of these jigsaw-type stones. This is part of the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo, too. It's perfectly fitted, jigsaw stones fitted together in, in, a, in a way, like in Peru, where you can't even get a, a knife blade or razor blade between the stones. This is a similar structure. This is in northwest Greece. It's near Albania. It's called the Necromanticon. It was only discovered in the 1960s, and it's, it's underground. Greek archaeologists discovered this building, uncovered it, and it, too, has like in Peru or at the Emperor's Palace in, in Tokyo, has these unusual jigstone type like construction patterns. When you go up above Cusco, there is the giant megalithic fort of Sacsayhuaman. It too has huge stones of, of limestone that have been quarried. They're fitted together also in this jigsaw pattern. There's, there's rows of uh, walls that go up above. The Spanish and the Incas fought a big battle here. There was supposedly a tower similar to round towers in Ireland, Ireland that were on top of this building. They don't know what it, how, what it was really for. Uh, that it was actually some kind of fort built by the Incas uh, they, is, is thought, but we'll see in a minute that probably the Incas didn't build this stuff. This is the fantastic megalithic city of, of Machu Picchu. It's a secret city on top of a mountain. Machu Picchu is, the, right now, it's the, the number one tourist destination in South America, and, and for good reason. It's, it's a fantastic place. It's beautiful views, and it itself is this amazing megalithic city. Notice here again, uh, cut blocks, they're notched. See also these curious knobs that we saw as well at the Osirion in Egypt. This too is a wall at Machu Picchu, perfectly fitted together and megalithic, notched, huge blocks, perfectly fitted, huge patches of limestone here too. Near to Machu Picchu, along the Urubamba River, is this site. It's called Ollante Tambo. And at Ollante Tambo, up on top of the mountain, is what they call the Sun Temple. 
as you go up these terraces and then you go up these stairs, you start entering uh, passages with these walls. Once again, you have these curious knobs. They don't know what these are for. They think it somehow has something to do with the actual building. Huge lichen patches here too, showing that it's very old. Once again, you see these knobs. Perfect fitting of, in this case, this is red granite. You see here how they have, even though that it's quite the unusual jigsaw pattern, all the stones fit perfectly. But as you come around the corner at Ollante Tombo, you start seeing some really unusual things. You start seeing giant blocks of granite like this. These blocks are just standing around like some kids building blocks that have been blown aside. This is the one wall that you see up there. And it is still intact. It has these unusual narrow strips here. Also, you see the curious knobs. And as you go around the corner to the right, you see this wall. And this wall here is what we'll focus on for a minute. As you look at this wall, notice here again how it's notched right here. It's coming down on the right. Clearly, some other giant megalithic block is to be fitted right here with this. But instead, you have this crummy rubble filling it in on either side. Now, mainstream archaeologists, said, this is so important in, in Peru because what the mainstream archaeologists are saying is that just like 200 years before the Spanish got to Peru, conquered South America, they're saying the Incas built all this stuff. And the Inca, they're saying that the Incas dragged this giant block up here, notched it like this, and then just filled it in with this crummy rubble. It really doesn't make sense. I mean, you're, you're, here is what we're, we're talking about. Here's that block right here. Here's these other blocks. This is exactly how it is today. It's how it was at the time of the Spanish conquest. And that's how it was also at the time of the Incas. The Incas are very recent. The Incas existed only a, a few hundred years prior to the Spanish getting there. So the mainstream archaeologists are saying, yeah, the, the Incas built all this stuff. They just dragged these giant blocks up here, left this one here, put some more rubble there, left those there, put this one here, notched it, and then they put that here. I mean, what's clear to me, and uh, what I constantly maintain in all my books, is that, yeah, this is some kind of pre-Inca megalithic building uh, from Atlantis or something like that. And this is Inca construction. So as you go and you look around at these blocks, I mean, they're, they're well articulated. I mean, they've actually squared them. They're going to do something really amazing with these blocks, but they did it. For some reason, they just completely stopped all of their building. Now we're looking at something, too. Look at this. These are keystone cuts on these blocks. Here's one right here. So you have it cut. This is a T-shaped keystone cut. You have to have another megalithic block right here. It's going to have a keystone cut, too, on it. And these, these blocks are huge. I mean, they're weighing 100 tons. You wouldn't think they would be going anywhere, but they want to connect them with these metal clamps that they pour in place. Here's what it looks like. This is what these blocks. I mean, here's a keystone cut ready to go just needs another giant block to be fitted against it. And they're saying that the Incas did all this. As you leave Cusco and you go up higher into the Andes, you will come to Lake Titicaca, highest navigable lake in the world. It's, it's about 13,000 feet in the Andes. And along the west side is this curious structure here. It's what they, they call the Devil's Door, the door of Amarururu. Some people call it a stargate. So it's built into this solid rock, granite. The thing is about 40 feet high right here. It's about six feet high. P 
People claim that they have interdimensional experiences here. You would think that other giant blocks were somehow one time either fitted up against this and are now gone or that they were meant to. And this is what it's like. This is actually bird guano. There's grooves. It's been cut. It's like something else, some other structure is meant to go into this wall and it's not there. You have also false doorways in Egypt. This is one near uh, the pyramids in Giza. It's a false doorway, uh, smaller. The Egyptians would do that. Also in Bolivia, that's uh, where Tiwanaku is, we're going to see that in a minute, is this curious site of Samaipata. This is, as you're going down more into the jungles of Bolivia, this is not thought to be built by the Incas. They don't know who built it. It's on top of a mountain, features these weird grooves, other um, cut stone things on the side. And here, too, it's like there were other blocks of stone, other structures were apparently fitted into this, and they're now long gone. There's nothing there left except for the majority of the rock itself. Right near there, uh, just in the nearby town that's down below the mountain, this guy is a Swiss Bolivian who owned an auto parts store, and he had a house up here, and he was digging it out, and what he found were all of these uh, different um, stones that were like part of some kind of plumbing system that would have channeled water and stuff like that into, the, into this huge, huge complex that, that now is basically gone. So as you go back uh, to Lake Titicaca, which is on the, the, in Bolivia, on the, the southern part of the lake, is the amazing ruins of Tiwanaku. They saying too, that one of the largest pyramids in the world was at Tiwanaku. This is the Akabana. In the middle of it, as well, was a, like a man-made reservoir right up here. Around Lake Titicaca, as well, there are underwater ruins. Jacques Cousteau went into Lake Titicaca, and there are stones there beneath, uh, underwater. In Lake Titicaca, as well, are, are seahorses, and which is very curious. Seahorses are... Uh, oceanic fish. I mean, they live in the oceans. They don't live at 13,000 feet. They do live in Lake Titicaca. Uh, what certain researchers have surmised is that Lake Titicaca was actually at sea level at one time and it took seahorses and things like that up with it to 13,000 feet. And then as snows from the Andes came down, Lake Titicaca eventually became a freshwater lake. And in fact, it, all the salt water dra drained into another lake in Bolivia called Lake Popo. James Churchward, uh, who was a British colonel in the 1800s, you, you will talk about him more in a minute, he believed that South America had been, as tectonic plates rose and fall, that there was the Amazon Sea and there was some kind of canal going through, and uh, that would be one possible explanation for uh, like seahorses and stuff like that at, at Tiwanaku. At Tiwanaku is the famous sun gate. He's wearing a feathered headdress. He's carrying these rods. He's actually, tears are coming down his eyes. This thing itself is not really from where it is in Tiwanaku. Somebody in, in prehistory took this giant one piece of granite and then he, it's actually from another area some miles away, and then he stuck it in this other area of Tiwanaku. But you can see here, too, how coming down here, this area is notched. Other huge walls would have been perfectly fitted into this. At Tiwanaku as well is this famous sunken temple, the Akabana, uh, or the Colosseo, they call it. And around that is... All of, there's hundreds of stone heads, it's supposedly to show all the different races of mankind are allegedly here depicted in this sunken temple. You've got here also some, Atiwanako does have some andesite statues. He's wearing a turban. That's a kind of a curious thing. And in Atiwanako and uh, other areas too, people wore turbans. 
And it's, it's sometimes said that in Atlantis, people wore a, a kind of a knotted turban. At Tiwanaku, right now, they're still excavating, and it, uh, the work starts and stops. What they have found, and in, in fact, they don't even, you're not supposed to take photos of this for some reason, but down here in Tiwanaku, what they found are all of these tunnels and passageways. And apparently, Tiwanaku, at one point, had entire rivers diverted into it, and water was flowing throughout the city. And probably what it was, was some kind of huge metallurgical plant. And they were washing ores out and uh, getting all kinds of various metals out of Tiwanaku. This is the famous Contiki statue that Thor hired all uh, named his boats after some of his expeditions that, where he would build these balsa rafts or these reed boats, and he would try and sail them across the oceans to prove transatlantic contact. He's known as Contiki. Notice here he's got a beard, he's got a mustache. American Indians do not have facial hair. They don't grow beards. They don't have mustaches. He's also holding his hands in a special way. This is known as the, the tiki position, and you see it in New Zealand, Tahiti, and things. One hand over your stomach, one hand over your heart. This is a very special thing in the Pacific Ocean, especially. And if you wear like a New Zealand greenstone pendant, uh, he'll always have his hands that way. Yeah, so you have this Akabana, this giant pyramid. It had a lake on top of it. It apparently, is, I mean, even how they got water up, it was some kind of huge hydraulic works. They got water up in here, they stored it, it then washed down through Tiwanaku, through all these passageways and tunnels, uh, apparently, in, in my mind, washing out the ores and things. About a mile away of Tiwanaku is, is a related site called Pumapunku. It, too, has giant blocks of granite, and there, again, are these keystone cuts. So here we go. In these keystone cuts, when they're at Oyante Tombo near Machu Picchu, well, they're built by the Incas. But now you have keystone cuts like this there at Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku is admitted to be pre-Inca. And in fact, you know, these giant blocks here, you wouldn't think they're going to go anywhere. But yeah, they wanted to put these keystone cuts and then metal clamps in here. This whole area is, is like uh, some kids' building blocks, giant building blocks are just, just thrown around like some huge earthquake that destroyed Tiwanaku. Here, more of these keystone cuts. You see how they need, there always has to be another stone on the other side for a keystone cut to work. Also, right nearby, this, I'm here with a, a British uh, engineer, he now lives in America, his name is Christopher Dunn, he, he manages machine shops. Uh, when we travel to Egypt and South America and other places together, he's always bringing his, his technical gauges and things like that. And this stone here at Tiwanaku, and it has all of these holes drilled in it, it has grooves going through it. According to him, as he measured it, uh, he, he felt that this, this had to be made by some kind of uh, power machine. That's what he says. I mean, hand tools couldn't do this, according to him. He's saying that they're using power tools, and what he's even measuring is the, the distance of each of these holes. So this is, he, he's, he's a, a friend of mine, and he wrote a book called The Giza Power Plant. You might have heard of that book. He's in his... His specialty really is looking at, the, at machining and how, in his mind, some blocks of stones are machined. And, and according to him, it can only be done by power tools. Also at Tiwanaku uh, and Pumapunku, you see here typical trenching by archaeologists. It's like this three, four, five feet of muck and mud just wiped out this city. So, Archaeologists dig these trenches just to see what's down there, find something. And yeah, they find also these blocks, more of these keystone cuts. The clamps are gone. That any person coming along here, uh, if, it, if these things are exposed, first thing they'll do is take those keystone, the clamps, 
and then they'll hammer them into spearheads and knives and swords and things like that. But you see here how these blocks, this building was just totally collapsed, but it's collapsed in a basically some kind of giant mud flow and, and tidal wave of, of muck and mud that somehow came from Lake Titicaca or the rising of the Andes. This is what one of these blocks looks like with a metal clamp actually poured into place. You have to pour molten metals into these things. And that itself is, is a tricky process and basically shows that somehow Tiwanaku was some huge metallurgical plant. Here are keystone cuts too. These are in Egypt. These are at Karnak, at Luxor. These Egyptian keystone cuts are often uh, hourglass kind of shaped. This is also a keystone cut in Egypt. It's like an axe head type keystone cut. I mean, you actually find this all over the world. Now mainstream archeologists are saying, no connection, no connection here. Keystone cuts in Egypt and in Peru or Bolivia, no, no, there's, there, there can't be any relationship, can there? But I mean, if that's true, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, how, could, how would people in far different places of the world create what is a pretty unusual method of, of fixing large blocks together? This is a wall at Edfu in southern Egypt near Aswan. And here you also see keystone cuts from, uh, these, are, these are keystone cuts, but this is a wall from dynastic Egypt only these blocks are not meant to be here. I mean, they've been scrounged from some other building by the Egyptians themselves. And then they've stacked them up just willy-nilly, a block here, a block there. Some of them have keystone cuts on them. They're, they're not ever going to have molten metal poured into them because, well, they're on a vertical wall. You, you can't pour molten metal into this. Here are a few blocks, like here. Yeah, they actually put the two blocks that were together originally. They re-put them together. Well, over here, here's a keystone cut, but you know, there's no corresponding one. I mean, this, this wall is not meant to be like this. It was just recreated in ancient times by the Egyptians. Back to Bolivia and South America. Bolivian and German archeologists in the 30s as they began excavating, I mean, they were amazed at these buildings. I mean, they, and architects, as they try and drew pictures of them, this is what they thought they looked like. These perfectly fitted granite blocks articulated with these Swiss clocks, uh, Swiss crosses and things like that. I mean, it was some kind of amazing structure built by expert builders. I mean, these guys were stonemasons par excellence. And this is what they think these huge buildings are like. Today, I mean, this is a bleak area of, of Bolivia. This is also, uh, by the way, where the potato or originates. And all around uh, Lake Titicaca, there's, there's over 300 types of potato. This is what some of these guys look like around Tiwanaku. He looks very American Indian. He's got, a, a, he's got a piercing here. He's wearing a turban. This is a pond. These guys are from Tiwanaku too. Look at this guy down here. He looks very uh, Chinese, very Oriental. This guy's from Tiwanaku as well. He looks like he's a Phoenician guy or something. He's got a big beard and a mustache. American Indians do not have facial hair. They don't shave, they don't grow mustaches, they don't grow beards. As you go down to the coast in uh, South America, Peru, you then find a lot of these weird skulls and they're at Tiwanaku too. Huge, huge dolocephalus, Cranial deformation, as they call it. Um, I often call them cone heads. I've, in my new book on mystery of the Olmecs, I have a whole section about this. These, these guys, these ones in Peru particularly have, I mean, they have doubled or tripled their, their cranium. And their brain inside is also twice as large as the modern humans. This guy here too, with this huge, weird, Skull. Uh, not the kind of guys you want to meet in a dark alley. Also in Peru, you have guys like this. And he's been tree panned 
and he's had a gold plate put in his head after some kind of brain surgery, and he survived, went on to live for years, and his, his uh, skull then healed and formed around this gold plate that they put in his head. This skull, too, and we don't know if this happened before or after his death, but he got a set of uh, crystal teeth. Here's the famous crystal skull. Uh, we were looking at it before. Uh, from, uh, this is the Anna Mitchell Hedges one with the movable jaw stone and stuff like that. The making of crystal skulls is very difficult, that the Mayans and other people could carve really quartz crystal. Uh, you need like diamond tools, diamond drills, diamond uh, saws, and things like that to work on these things. <coughs> You have also uh, more skulls here, and this one's also, uh, this one's in Mexico here. Some of these guys, too, they have, um, they often were thought to have red hair, and you see red-haired skulls in, in Peru. This guy's wearing a red turban. This is a skull from Peru. He's a red-haired guy. You might think maybe uh, Vikings or somebody like that were headed into Peru. Right along uh, the coast of Peru, near Paracas, is this, the candlestick of the Andes, it's called. It can really only be seen from the ocean. It's like some huge naval marker for sailors. And you're coming down the coast of Peru, and you see this thing, and then you have an idea, okay, this is where we need to dock. Also in this area, and this is the area of these giant, weird, deformed skulls and stuff, too, you have the Nazca Plain. Uh, and you want to fly over this, you can't really see these things unless you're flying in the air. There's hummingbirds, there's all kinds of lines. Some of these lines go for hundreds of miles straight through the Andes up towards Tiwanaku. This one here, there's uh, like hummingbirds and things like that etched into the ground. Weird trapezoids just sort of going here. Lines intersecting willy-nilly. I mean, What's it all about? I mean, they, they're trying to figure it out. There, there must be a lot of different things superimposed on each other. They look for astronomical uh, and astrological alignments, things like that. And they find some, but it really just doesn't explain all the stuff they're doing there. It, it's still a mystery. My latest book has been about the Olmecs, and I, I, more and more that I research the Olmecs, uh, uh, the more mysterious they got, they too had the deformed skulls. They would do this cone head thing and elongate their, cone, their heads. This is what these Olmec guys look like, like this. They have these elongated skulls, weird eyes, a bunch of oddball characters. This one, too. This is in the Yucatan, this skull. This guy's actually had his whole face flattened and widened. Now, we don't know why they did this. It had to do, has to do with... Uh, the aristocracy. We do know that uh, as children, young babies, before they're, they're, the plates in their heads fuse when they're about two years old, if you, you can start to shape the skull. And apparently this is what they did. We don't know if they were imitating uh, other people they saw. I mean, that's one theory. Uh, well, they were imitating extraterrestrials or something like that. They wanted to double the capacity of their brain. They wanted to, to look taller. It was some kind of elitist thing, too, where, where it was the, the aristocracy who looked like this. The Olmecs weren't even known until, really, the early 1940s, and that they started finding these giant basalt heads. They weigh about 20 tons. They would find them in the, the oil exploration areas of, of the Atlantic coast, huge, huge basalt heads just in swamps and things like that. Bulldozers would uncover them. And one of the things about the colossal heads, as these guys are called, is that they look really African. They, they, they're wearing helmets or turbans. They have the wide nose and the thick lips. They look like some Nigerian rugby players or something like that. They find these, too, in the Pacific Coast, too. They, they find them in Guatemala. Olmec artifacts have been found all the way down to Costa Rica and Panama, and well up the Pacific Coast as well. 
Some of the Olmec heads were, uh, they were, they were completely buried in these areas. And then people were like walking across this one. There was a little trail. And finally people noticed a nose and stuff like that. And then archeologists began to dig it out. Here's that head now at the, uh, one of the museums in Jalapa. But you see how, uh, in this case, very, very uh, African looking guys. This guy too, this is how they find them. These giant, giant weird heads. This is made out of basalt as well, which is extremely hard to carve. Also, at some of these Olmec cities, the Labenta, very, very good uh, sewage and water systems. These cities were like pre-planned cities, uh, extremely well made. And the whole Olmec area really is what they call the Isthmus of Tehuantepec this area right down in here. Although the Olmecs were up the Pacific coast, they were down into Guatemala and El Salvador, even farther south. But this is the area of the Olmecs. It's called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in, in the very southern part of Mexico. And it's the narrowest part of Mexico between the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. And in fact, when they were first trying to build uh, something like the Panama Canal, there were three uh, places that they wanted to do it. One was here at the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and the other one was in Nicaragua, and the third was in Panama, where they did build a canal. What the Mexican government did instead of building a canal across here was they built a railroad to connect these areas. But it's interesting here that the Olmecs, this was their area. They, those colossal heads are in this Atlantic area, but it's thought that the Olmecs originally started here around in a uh, the Pacific area where Guatemala and, um, come together. This guy's an Olmec too. Here, he looks very Egyptian. He appears to have a false beard. He's wearing a headdress that's kind of Egyptian. This guy's an Olmec. In fact, everything that they used to uh, ascribe to the Mayans, they now ascribe to the Olmecs. That's the number system, the hieroglyphs, the ball game. He's holding a rubber ball here. Soccer, uh, football, it originated with the Olmecs. How about that? By the way, the Olmecs typically are said to go back to about 1,300 BC, so over 3,000 years ago at least for the Olmecs. Here's a chart at uh, Comacalco, one of the Olmec capitals. These are all, all these guys are Olmecs. Here's what they look like, and they're weird, uh, elongated heads. This guy down here looks very Chinese. Weird, weird guys. They were obsessed with jade as well. And to the Olmecs and Mayans, as well as the Chinese, jade was the most valuable of all the commodities. In fact, this, these guys, these figurines of Olmecs, they're, they're made of jade. And you can see again what these guys look like, the long hair, kind of oriental sort of eyes in a way. Mainstream archaeologists are saying, well, these guys are just American Indians. You know, they're, they don't have any connection with Africa or, or Pacific or any place like that. Well, the Egyptians also did this cranial binding too and creating the elongated craniums. This is Meritaten, who was one of the daughters of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And she too is, is basically a conehead with a cranial deformation. Tutankhamun, he's also a conehead. He has a deformed cranium as well. This is a statue from his, uh, uh, from his tomb. And this is, this is what he looked like. You can get a better, this is also Tutankhamun. You get a better idea of what his head was. Also in Tutankhamun's tomb, by the way, was a trunk of boomerangs. I, not just one boomerang. No, he was a boomerang nut. <laughs> Had a whole trunk of boomerangs. And you, yeah, you, you think of boomerangs as, you know, that, well, that's some Australian Aboriginal thing. Well, the Egyptians hunted with boomerangs. Boomerangs have been found all over the world. And, and boomerangs are, have been used in the American Southwest and Mexico as well. If you go to the Mexico City Museum, you'll see boomerangs. This whole thing of cranial deformation was worldwide. Kurds in northern Iraq were still doing this right up in the 1960s. Uh, Pacific Islands like Vanuatu, they were also doing this right up until modern times. 
This is in the Belgian Congo. This is a photograph taken in the 1920s. This kid, his head is bound. He's going to be a conehead when he grows up. Yeah. And a weird, a weird looking one, too. It, you wonder what happened to him. <laughs> so you go, you go south now, uh, south of in, into Central America to Costa Rica. And one of the weird things there are these round granite balls. And some of them are huge. Uh, they're big. They're big. They, they're perfectly spherical granite. Uh, Stonemasons tell me today this is one of the hardest things to make is a perfect round ball just to take your hammer and chisel. Uh, to make a perfectly round one is almost impossible and these things are perfectly round. They, uh, they don't know why, where they came from. They just they find them in the jungles and stuff on the, uh, on the west coast. This is where they find these and there's an island right over here too. They also find them. It's like some big wave or something hit Costa Rica and washed these big stone balls up into this part of Costa Rica. Panama's right here, so they're, they're right along the border with, with Panama. They've, the, the natives in Costa Rica took some of the small balls like this, a um, few feet in diameter, and I mean, one thing about these giant megalithic marbles is that, yeah, you can move them kind of easily, at least a little bit, you know, by because they're easy to roll. So, you know, people would sort of put them in their burial, you know, site of their chief or something, but, but no, no one has any idea, like, what these things are for. Uh, but there, have, I mean, there are a few ideas. In our magazine, World Explorer, this is one of the uh, unusual little articles we had in there. A guy sent this to me. When they were building the Los Angeles trolley, through Santa Monica, they used this steam shovel to had to take out this this hill right there in Los Angeles because uh, the you know the trolley had to have pretty flat grade, and what they found were all these stone balls inside this hill. How about that? And I mean, this was 1920, and the, the ones in Costa Rica weren't even really known yet. Well, they you know geologists came in and they went, oh well, it's uh, dinosaur eggs, you know. <laughs> So I've been, I've been actually, in the last few years, gotten really fascinated with giant megalithic stone balls. There's some in Malta. Uh, there's, I just saw one in a, one of the books downstairs was in Sardinia. I'm always interested in these things. And I've, some are supposedly natural. Others are, uh, are man-made, definitely. All right, so now we're headed into the Pacific Ocean and... This is a round stone ball on Easter Island. How about that? So yeah, they have these round stone balls on Easter Island. And in fact, supposedly, the first time I went there, I, I didn't realize this. It wasn't until my, my second time to Easter Island that uh, people had told me and I began researching. They said, well, the most sacred thing of all on Easter Island is this round ball right here. And it, it's in a little remote area of the north coast of Easter Island. There, there's is a, there's a, a little mini village right there, but it's just this ball. And in fact, this this wall around it is basically a wall to contain this thing. And I mean, this is only it's about three feet or so in diameter. The ones in Costa Rica are a lot bigger, but I thought it was curious that. The mythology on Easter Island is that this round stone is the most sacred thing. And, w and why, no one knows, but there's something magical about it, they say. There's not any of the stone heads right near that ball, but these stone heads are found all over Easter Island. Many of them are in the crater. They're often buried deep up to their chests or even, but, but often, usually about half of these statues is still underground. And archaeologists don't really explain that very well because, uh, you know, for them to build up 20 feet of ground soil around them would show that they're really, really old. But that's not what archaeologists say. They're only, again, uh, made supposedly a few hundred years before the, the Spanish and the Dutch got there. But here you can see this guy. I mean, he's buried up to his chin here. I mean, there's, there's a whole other body right down to the waist twice as big as this, below ground. 
And it's not like the Easter Islanders would have like purposely buried these guys. No. Uh, they're around the crater. Here, you can see these guys, like this guy, this one over. I mean, there's another 30 feet underneath these guys. They don't have feet. According to, this is the big quarry, Arana Roraku. According to the legends on Easter Island, uh, these things, by the way, they're cone heads too. They have the flat heads and stuff like that. These guys also had some kind of, their, their statues are depicting cranial deformation. As you go up these cut stone stairs into solid rock, into the crater, which is the quarry on Easter Island, it's kind of in the, sort of in the middle of the island, but down to one side, what you have is this crater lake right here, and it, and it has in it Totoro reeds, the same reeds that are at Lake Titicaca. These are the reeds they built the reed ships out of. These are the same reeds that Thor hired all, uh, uh, built his ships out of. And as you go in there, here's the big quarry. This is where they really uh, cut all the stone heads and stuff like that. Here's the reed lake here. But all in this area, too, are more of these stone heads. And they're all looking down into, here they are. They're all looking, and they're all buried. But they cut them in the, the quarry, and they moved them here. And they're looking down into the lake. It's kind of like a natural amphitheater, something like that. Up in this area, too, there are seven stone seats, supposedly. These elders or masters or somebody, they sat up here. But here are these stone statues, which, which never really went very far. They stayed all around the quarry. Here's one of the largest stone statues still in the quarry. This one was, was not removed. It's still sitting there. It's one of the largest of the statues. Some of these things are, are 100 feet high. This one was actually discovered by Thor Heyerdahl in uh, Easter Island. And he is, this is a unique statue because he's in an unusual kneeling position known as Quizuo. And this is a Shang Chinese dynasty statue from the Shang dynasty. It was about also 1,300 BC. And the, the Quizuo position is this unusual position of being on your knees with your hands on your knees and your head forward. Here's an Egyptian statue in the Quizuo position. This is your, your kneeling forward, your hands are on your knees, and it's a kind of a, it's an unusual position, one that has to do with, with some kind of subjugation to a ruler. You, you get down in front of the king, you're on your knees, you put your head forward, and you put your hands on your knees. At Tiwanaku, also, statues were found like this with their hands on their knees, they're kneeling down, uh, they're wearing turbans too. Here, these have been moved into the Tiwanaku Museum right now. The Olmecs as well. Many of the statues, the Olmecs, are in this curious Quizuo kneeling position. This guy has this top head a little on him, and that's what the Easter Island statues had that too, a red top knot. They were wearing these red hats. This is a small statue from Harappa in the Indus Valley. He too is in this unusual kneeling Kuzuo position. Very unusual and distinctive. Again, mainstream archaeologists are saying, oh, no, no connection here. Um, Rongo Rongo writing, which is the writing on Easter Island. Here's this remote island. At, Easter Island is one of the remotest islands in the world. Ha Hawaii is also quite remote. And they supposedly developed their own language. It's written as the ox plowed, with what they call Bosafuidran writing, where each line is read left to right, and the next line right to left, left to right. And that writing, which is still undeciphered, but it's very similar to the Indus Valley writing that uh, today you find in India and, and Pakistan. This is a Rongo Rongo tablet with the curious hieroglyphs. Each line is, is read left to right, then right to left, left to right. Doric Greek was written like this. Uh, also Hittite, the Hittite. And it's thought also that the Hittites were some of the people who were mining some of the uh, copper up in northern Michigan. This is Hittite writing here. And Hittite writing was, what early Hittite writing was a hieroglyphic writing like Egyptian. And it would be left to right, right to left, or up and down, and then up, down. 
There's this statue on Easter Island too, very curious statue, very unlike the other ones, with breasts, also a weird, long gated skull. This is, I mean, this is, this is a stone statue, so, uh, supposedly depicting maybe what somebody actually looked like. Uh, here it can, I mean, it would, would have had quite the unusual cone head, I would say. Other statues on Easter Island were, were, according to the legends, they were placed around the edge of the island, looking into the interior of the island. So what they did was, they took some of the statues, and they moved them around the island, and they faced them inward, and they put eyes in the island, so they, in the faces, so they had these inlaid eyes. And according to the legend that they say, and it, this is in the tourist brochures at Easter Island, they claim that Easter Island was part of another land they call Hiva, H-I-V-A. But Hiva disappeared beneath the waves of the Pacific Ocean. But Easter Island was the, the fulcrum, and it stayed uh, above the water. And, it, and today, Easter Island is this small, triangular uh, island. And so what they did was they took these statues and they placed them all around the outside of the island, facing inward with these eyes. And this is what they say, that this power came out of their eyes called mana. And, and in fact, mana is like a, a Sanskrit word. And it means a, a occult power, and the power came out of the eyes of these statues, this is what they say, and it protected the island and kept it from sinking beneath the waves. This is, this is a very well-known, popular legend on Easter Island. What happened later, in fact, there was a war between the, the long ears and the short ears, they say, on Easter Island. It's another thing with the, uh, the Easter Island statues. They have very, very long earlobes. I mean, quite extended. And you'll, you see this Buddha, depictions of Buddha. He also has very big earlobes. Kind of interesting thing to look at with when you see statues and things, whether they have these like really big earlobes. Easter Island statues have that. You can see how some of the statues are so huge. Now, according to the islanders, the, these statues walked around the island themselves. That's what they say, although they didn't have feet. Some of them, here's the guy who's in the Kuzuo position here, kneeling. He's a unique statue. There's only one statue on Easter Island like that. You can see, too, uh, how these things are, are so buried. Uh, guy standing, this is part of Thor Heyerdahl's exhibitions, expeditions. And in fact, even a boat is like drawn on, on this chest down here. But you know, you have to wonder, like, why is there so much uh, soil built up around it. Uh, archaeologists saying, oh, these statues have only been here a few hundred years before the Spanish got there. But I mean, it would, in my mind, it seems like they've been there for thousands of years. How they moved these statues around, they don't know. They, the islanders say that they walked where they went. So I, when you go to Easter Island, they say, well, yeah, they built these cradles, and, and this is kind of a small statue. And they rocked it around, you know, and it's, eventually they got it somewhere and they, they stood it up. Um, although it would make a lot more sense <coughs> if they really walked these statues upright, like a refrigerator that you might walk around. And although, according to them, they honestly believe that the statues themselves actually walked. And in fact, here's a weird thing. The statues could only walk in a clockwise manner around the island. Here's where the crater is over here, where they're where they're made, uh, this area, and then they but they had to walk. So according to Easter Islanders, this is weird. There's this magnetic field right around here. In fact, uh, Jacques Cousteau's son Philippe had an ultralight on the uh, on the boat, and they the Calypso, and they told him they said, well, if you're going to fly your ultralight around Easter Island, don't stay away from this volcano over here. They said, don't fly over there. And because there's this anomalous magnetic field, and in, and in fact, compasses won't work right on, Ma on Easter Island. They, they won't port, point north. They'll point to this thing right here. Philippe Cousteau, uh, it totally ignored them, jumped in his ultralight, took off, flew around this mountain. The instruments in his ultralight went crazy. He crashed 
and was almost killed, and they had to medevac him to Santiago to the hospital and save his life. So it's kind of a curious thing that he, that supposedly, and I get into this in my book about lost cities and ancient Lemuria in the Pacific, like there are statues around this part of the coast, but here's the quarry. But the Easter Islanders are saying, oh, well, for a statue, couldn't go from here to over there, that short distance. According to them, the, the statue had to walk around this magnetic thing here and come like this. That's what they say. There's also where supposedly some of the statues were up here on these cliffs. Would have been very difficult to get them up there. So you've got the huge lichen patches on the statues. I mean, in, today, mainstream archaeologists are basically saying, well, you, you know, you just had some Polynesians who got to this island. Uh, they, you know, got bored, so they started, they embedded their own writing. They built these, all these giant statues, you know, just something to do. But now, here, you'll see, this is one of the ruins on Easter Island. Called, it's called Vinapu. It is like the buildings in Peru. And you see the curved stone walls, you see the perfect fitting together, you see notched stones, it's notched over here. It was kind of a unique platform, but here you really see, and, and a lot of archaeologists have pointed this out, what this building in Easter Island is identical type of construction that you see in Peru and that's significant. I mean, there's, there really is a, a, a connection there. It, it, how they can doubt it is beyond me, but they do. And they uh, may continue to maintain that Easter Island and South America have, have no connection. Francis Mazier, he was a French archaeologist, uh, and he, he lived in Easter Island for the 60s. And he had an unusual thing. Because Easter Islanders say that they're from this lost continent, this lost land called Hiva, he proposed, and he was a pretty mainstream archaeologist in a way, he proposed that there was this mountain ridge right here going north and that this was all land right here. Uh, you know, and even at some point during the Polynesian occupation, and it sank into the ocean. If you do look at underwater relief maps of the, this area of the Pacific, you'll see that there is a big submarine ridge here, just like he's got, uh, and that in theory, yeah, with certain earth movements, could be above water. This is James Churchward. He wrote The Lost Continent of Moo Books. He was a, he was a British colonel. He was sent to, uh, to India in the late 1800s. He became a mystic. He said that he uh, was taught by this rishi in India who, who basically told him about, you know, ancient civilizations and around India and in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific. And he was sent by this rishi uh, as he, once he retired from the British Army to go out into the Pacific and look for evidence for Mu. And he did that. And he, kind of like Eric von Doniken, who sort of found uh, you know, every painting and cave painting was an extraterrestrial, Church would go out and he would, he'd find writing of Mu, you know, just about everywhere he went. But he was a pretty cool guy, and uh, he was quite wealthy to travel through the Pacific back then, the late 1800s, turn of the century. Very expensive. I mean, he was a wealthy guy, so he could do all this. And in fact, he was one of the inventors of stainless steel. He, in his later lives, he lived, uh, his later life, he lived in New York and around uh, Philadelphia, and Bethlehem Steel had, was had to pay him royalties on stainless steel, molybdenum steel, they call it. And he had invented this right around World War I. But to avoid paying him royalties, they supposedly concocted a bad accident for him where molten steel was to be poured on him while he was uh, touring the, the, the steel plant. And that's he figured they were trying to kill him at that point. He did survive and got away from it. So Churchward himself, I mean, he had a lot of kind of oddball ideas. A lot of them came from India. He believed that, yeah, there was this continent of Mu in the Pacific. The, the South America was this Amazonian sea like this. Uh, Atlantis was in the Atlantic. He thought people migrated all over the world. 
He also came up with the idea of pole shifts, that the Earth, that ice builds up at the poles, and the Earth, according to him, would occasionally sh shift forward. And uh, there would, this would be devastating cataclysms all over the world. Continental plates would rise and fall. Every volcano would go off. There would be massive earthquakes. Huge tidal waves would wash over continents. This with mammoths are flash frozen in Siberia, that kind of a thing. Other groups, too, thought that there was these continents in the Pacific, the Lemurian Fellowship. They actually uh, believed that this lost continent, the Pacific, took in part of California and Australia. And in fact, I mean, there's some unusual things there where you have these ray tights, these giant birds like the moa, ostriches, uh, the uh, rheas and stuff like that, that these giant flightless birds somehow originated on, on some continent. By the way, too, marsupials are no basically known to be in Australia, but North America does have a marsupial, too. We have marsupial possums in, in a North America like in Australia. So yeah, there's kind of a, for all marsupials, there is something that corresponds with it in uh, North and South America. So it's, so yeah, even zoologists, biologists are saying, yeah, there's, there's some kind of evidence for some pan-Pacific kind of land bridge and stuff like that. Churchward also said that ancient Indian records talked about ancient Ceylon, and he thought the Maldives, that there was a, a, a sunken land to the south of India, uh, now, Vedic scholars are more and more saying exactly that. And in the last few years, uh, the, these guys in India, uh, mainly the Tamil guys, they're saying, yeah, there was this uh, continent that went out. Sri Lanka was all part of it. Down here, this submerged Tamil Nadu, Pandi Pandyan uh, kingdom, uh, and the ancient Mahabharata, these, these really, really ancient Indian texts are talking about that. And in fact, re recently, satellite photos of southern India and Sri Lanka show what they call Rama's Causeway. And this thing is underwater now, but what satellite photos are showing is that, yeah, there was like a big, long... And, and in ancient India, they say it was man-made that connected southern India and Sri Lanka. Here you can see it. Now this is underwater right now, but yeah, it's like there was uh, some kind of road or something like that. It, that's, and it's now about 20, 30 feet underwater. This would be, I mean, a lot like what you have to Key West. If you go to Florida today, you can drive along something like this that's man-made that links all of these islands out to Key West. Throughout Southeast Asia and Indonesia, they say that Indonesia would have, and all this area would have been connected together. A lot of these areas were Hindu originally, uh, going back thousands and thousands of years. But at places like Angkor Wat in Cambodia, what they did was they, they recarved these Hindu temples into Buddhist temples, which is what you see in Cambodia and other areas. In Cambodia as well, you see there's megalithic construction there. And you see the keystone cuts here, too, at Angkor Wat, are the same kind of keystone cuts that you see in Tiwanaku. You see them in, in Egypt, also in Greece. These are keystone cuts. These are like the Egyptian ones, where you have the hourglasses. This is a really unusual way of fitting uh, stones together, and you then pouring molten metals into it. When the Japanese archaeologists discovered these keystone cuts and metal clamps at, at Angkor Wat, they also they thought this was really important. And they're now thinking that Angkor Wat is much older than they've currently said. Angkor Wat, too, is only just a few hundred years before like, the French colonization. This is a, a site called Cam, and um, my son, they call it, in Vietnam. It's also a megalithic stone site. It's near Da Nang. And you have also keystone cuts there and the things. And these guys, Cam, these were called the Cam people. Many of them also looked uh, very African. Cam was the ancient word for Egypt. Here, this is at, in, at Cam in Vietnam. Here you see the same kind of keystone cuts that you see at Tiwanaku, 12,000 feet in the, in the Andes. More keystone cuts. 
here in, the, in CAM in Vietnam. In fact, I showed these to our guide. I was just there in December. And we had our tour guide take us around the, the ruins. And I showed him these. I say, hey, yeah, did you see these keystone cuts that you've got here? And he had never seen them before, he said. I mean, here I was showing my guide, you know, stuff about his own ruins. He was supposed to be showing me. Um, Cam there, too. It, these guys were Hindus. And this is Shiva. He's got his third eye right there. Also kind of a top knot, like, like these guys. There, this is Da Nang. This is the demilitarized zone right here, the Vietnam War. Uh, this was like the dividing line between North and South Vietnam. This, was, this area here was all the demilitarized zone. These guys, these CAM, CHAM or CAM, this was their main headquarters, was this island off Vietnam. And then from here, they went out into the Pacific. And they were able to go uh, beyond the Philippines, out to Tonga and the Central Pacific. This is actually a pyramid in Java called Candisuka. It looks exactly like Mayan pyramids that you find in, uh, in, in Guatemala and Mexico. Uh, it's a megalithic city, too, uh, and pyramid site. I went there some years. It's difficult to get to. It's in the, right in the middle of Java. Megalith building went on right up into the 20s. These guys trying to, they probably didn't cut this stone, but they were like moving it around. And this was also, this was in Indonesia, uh, moving these things. And you kind of see, the French archaeologists believe that, yeah, people came out into Indonesia from, from, uh, from around Egypt and also India together out to Southeast Asia and Indonesia and then out into the Central Pacific, areas like this. Tonga would be right in here. Tahiti over here is like Easter Island down here. And most of the Central Pacific is known as the Polynesian Triangle with Hawaii up here and New Zealand, Easter Islands over here at one end of the triangle. The central area of this would be Tahiti, really. Tonga's right over here. This area here, what they call Melanesia, these guys are all very, very African and dark. I mean, they, uh, so I mean, the idea that, that Negroes, blacks, you know, are from Africa, well, they're, for whatever reason, they're also from this area here. Um, how they got there, I mean, anthropologists don't know. Micronesia is this area more oriental. Polynesians, by the way, are allegedly Caucasians. I mean, they are, uh, if, you know, with, as anthropologists will say, you're, you're white or you're black or you're yellow or you're red. The Polynesians are white people. Where they, they had to come from India and Egypt or something. They, right now they say they came from India. But they had to go through past Australia, past New Guinea, past Indonesia, to get out into the Central Pacific. And that's never really been explained. In Fiji, again, these guys, they wore turbans and stuff like that. This northern island of Fiji, which is actually a Polynesian island called uh, Rotuma, they kept, uh, kept tourists and archaeologists from going there for years. But this also has huge basalt blocks that were man-made brought to places, they're squared off, they're kind of stacked up in these weird platforms. These things weigh 20 tons, 30 tons, and they don't know what they're for. Japanese archaeologists finally went there. I'm one of the few people who have ever been to this place. And what they did was they were studying the weird magnetism of these blocks. And they would put oddball magnetometers and special interest instruments on here trying to check the magnetism, and basalt is magnetized. This is another area of cement columns near New Caledonia. I talk about this in my book. French archaeologists went there. The, these, they're made out of concrete, made out of cement. The Ro Mayans used cement. The Romans used cement. Also in the southwest of the United States, they used cement. Cement's been used a long time. They tried to date the columns, the cement here, and they knew these were things were man-made. And they, were, they said they were 11,000 years old. So those things, they're, those... Cement columns are right down in here. Vanuatu, they do the head binding and stuff here. Rotuma's over here. Now Samoa, Tonga. They date all these things to at least 1000 BC from this kind of pottery, which is called Lapita pottery. Huge megalithic buildings, like uh, this one is in Madagascar. 
So at some point, the Polynesians and other Asians, they went out from Indonesia and Southeast Asia. They went to Africa. They went to Madagascar and Southern Africa. They also went out into the Pacific. They went to Tonga. This is an Egyptian navigation stick that the Egyptians would use. They had Egyptian star charts like this for navigating and, and constellations. And in fact, uh, you know, the Egyptians had huge, huge boats. They were either reed boats, they were wooden boats. They had boats that they could totally dismantle out of wood, and they could just pack them up, carry them over uh, you know, some isthmus or something like that, and then re-put these boats together if they had to. And it's a curious thing, because all over the Pacific, you have the word ra, ra iti, ra pa iti. Ra this, ra that. Ra is one of the Egyptian words for the sun. So the ancient sun kings of the Pacific. Bess in, was this dwarf god in Egypt, and he was, he was a dwarf, he was a hunchback, and he was a god of good luck. Sailors used Bess. Bess was often a, 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 a small statue you carried with you. He was the god of good luck. This is also an Egyptian depiction of Bess in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. But it looks very, very Polynesian. I mean, this is something you would probably see in Tahiti, really, of these guys. This looks exactly like the, the kind of art in Tonga and Tahiti, but he's the Egyptian god Bess. Early explorers in the Pacific, guys were he heavily tattooed. They had star charts and stuff like that tattooed on them. In uh, Tonga are pyramids, like in other areas of the world. The Tonga Trilithon, which is also a, an archaeo -ast astronomical device, and Churchward had gotten there. And in fact, Churchward was told, go look for the lost continent of Mu. Well, when you get to Tonga and you go to the old pyramid site, it's called Mu, Mu'a, right here, the ancient capital of Tonga. And in fact, Tongans are afraid to go into this area. I mean, even though Tonga is not that big an island and it has a huge um, lagoon in the center of it, which would have been a, a perfect naval base for huge ships, Tonga still had giant Tongaraki canoes uh, being used right up to the time of conquest. And re really at the time of Captain Cook and the European explorers in the Pacific, it was really only Tonga that still had really, really large ships. And Tonga was the last, and, and some say it was the only country that has never been colonized, simply because the Tongans, and, and Tongans are huge. These guys are giant, seven-foot-tall dudes, and they have their... their their Tongaraki canoes is all in Tonga. These are the Tonga pyramids. So the, and the, the people in Tonga, they don't want to go to these places. Very superstitious. There are ghosts there. This is an old photo of one of the big blocks in Tonga. And look over here, you see a weird notching. So even these stones, which is a kind of a coral, they were notched and fitted together. So Tonga itself is this central naval base, uh, pyramid area, finely cut stones, finely fitted together. Here's the trilithon there, the giant blocks. And in fact, these stones are not from the main island of Tonga. They were supposedly brought from very, very far north of Tonga in one of the islands, hundreds of miles away, which has been quite a feat. This is actually a quarry uh, in in Tonga that's, that's partially underwater. Now, some years ago, too, I was, I was brought to New England, New Zealand by, uh, and by Barry Brailsford. Some of his books are downstairs. And Barry had gotten involved in what was called the Kaimanawa Wall. It was an area that, that had been uh, a logging area in a forest on the North Island, had to cut a road through a hill. And what they found there were these cut stone blocks. They were rectangular. They seemed to be uh, fitted together, uh, like what you see in Tonga. But it was covered by uh, an ash deposit that they knew was over 2,000 years old. So 
here's Barry Brailsford doing some of the studies here. Uh, you see what it, these blocks are fitted together. The New Zealand government got really uh, uptight about this because they just couldn't have these megalithic ruins in New Zealand because supposedly the Maoris all got there in the big canoe and that that canoe had only arrived about 600, 800 AD. And here were these giant ruins in New Zealand that were clearly over 2,000 years old. So the New Zealand government just had to uh, somehow disproved it. This had to be natural, couldn't be man-made. So the New Zealand geologists came in, this is him, so they had to have a theory where this was just a natural formation, the, the, the blocks had crystallized into rec perfect rectangles. Uh, all right, and, and then, but of course, you know, you, even they couldn't admit that it would have such a perfect face, so what they, their theory was that the block had to fall forward, and it had, kind, had prismatically crystallized, but then the face fell off. So what you had was this, what looked like a man-made wall, but it wasn't a man-made wall, it was just natural. So to prove their theory, they had to big a, dig a big trench right here in front of the wall, because rubble from the wall falling over would have to be there. And here you go, here's the wall, but no, they, they could not prove it, they, I, although you know, they didn't bring backhoes and things like that in. So yeah, this, this all, I was on the BBC and stuff at the time. But even today, I mean, the New Zealand government tries to hide this thing. Uh, they don't want people to know where it is, and they do not admit that there are some megalithic walls in New Zealand. Rarotonga, this is an, another island just north of New Zealand. In fact, Tonga and Rarotonga, these, these ancient islands, they know people have been Tonga for at least 3,000 years. Uh, and there was a megalithic road that went through there. This is the Tonga Rocky canoes. They could hold up to 200 people. This is what the Tongans did. There's that weird island in the north of Tonga, and it has a megapode bird, one of these flightless birds that lay the big eggs, like moas, like ostriches. But it lives on this remote island on this one island in Tonga and zoologists say yeah they they couldn't fly there these birds had to walk to those islands they had to Tahiti has pyramids and things too also on Tahiti uh, like this scarab Egyptian hieroglyphs and things like that so this is a remote island you're not allowed to go to this one this is Rapa E.T. again the raw sound in, uh, which is one of the Austral Islands in the South Pacific. It's part of French Polynesian. But at the top of this mountain is also, they've carved this mountain out. There's like a city at the top, kind of like a Machu Picchu. Here they're going up to it. You, you cannot really go to this place. At Thor Heyerdahl went there in the 50s on his private boat. Uh, this, and one of the reasons allegedly is that French atomic testing is, is near this area. So that area of the Pacific is, is off limits. You go to the Marquesas, you also have these giant uh, basalt formations. North of Tahiti, north of the Mar Marquesas, is this weird island here called Malden's Island. It has pyramids and platforms on it too, and it has roads that go into the ocean. This island is uninhabited. No one lives there today. At the time of European colonization too, no one has lived on this island for hundreds of years. Uh, even today, you can only get there, and here's some of the stone platforms. You, you need to go in a private yacht to this island or charter something. I mean, I, it's the rare, rare person who's been there, and, and I haven't been there either. So you have these oddball deserted islands. They have pyramids and ruins in it. And this will be just the last little bit here, and we'll be all over. This is really the eighth wonder of the world. This is the city of Nan Madal. It is a city built out of basalt crystals. Some of the walls are 30, 40 feet high. It's built as over 100 artificial islands built into the ocean. This is an island near Guam. These that's built in the sort of what we call Lincoln log fashion. These things are basalt crystals. That the heaviest of them weighs 50 tons, supposedly. This is what it, it looks like, huge blocks of basalt. Uh, the Olmecs built like this, too. 
Get this. Archaeologists say there's over 150 million tons of basalt in this city. This is a city, it's, it's 10 square miles, it's over 100 artificial islands. This city is not on the island of Pompeii in Micronesia, it's in the ocean. So walls like this that you're seeing, they're, they're built on an artificial island that's built on a coral reef. 150 million tons of basalt are stacked up in these artificial walls like this. They don't know where the stone came from. In fact, entire mountains could have been dismantled to get the basalt material to build this city. It is so huge. The islanders are afraid to go there today. They think if they spend the night here, they'll die. Huge, huge basalt breakwaters. This is the ocean coming up here. Big walls. Today it's a giant mangrove swamp. There are canals between these artificial islands. Uh, then there are these huge walls going up, 30, 40 feet. Other islands like this, the ocean's coming in. This island out here is artificial island. It, it's made with, by bringing these basalt crystals out there, stacking them up, 150 million tons. It, it's it's mind-blowing. You can't believe how they could have done this. Mainstream archaeologists, I mean, they, they have to explain it. And to them, it's like, oh, well, you know, the islanders, they just, uh, they... You know, they, they went and got these stones, they put them on rafts, and they floated in there, and then they stacked them up in these walls. Uh, here's where it is. This is the island of Ponape. It's near to Guam. It's, it's between, really, Guam and, and Philippines and stuff and, and Hawaii. Down here is Namadal. That city is here. It's in the ocean. It's in the ocean on this part, this whole area. You'll see some more maps of it. Here it is. This is a really old map. See all the... It's like a checkerboard of squares. It's built onto a coral reef. This is quite deep here. This is an artificial island over here, too. All these things you're looking at, they're artificial islands of basalt. Then with giant walls, there's canals going through them. At high tide, you're going to take, you're going to go to this city in a boat. The basalt is stacked up. Basalt is magnetic. And in fact, there's weird light phenomena that occurs in this city. And that's probably one of the reasons why the natives are afraid of it. If you go there at night, you'll see like balls of light occasionally moving around the city. It's quite unusual. Uh, and like I say, they are afraid to go there. They think if they spend the night here, they'll, they'll die. I mean, people today do not live near this thing. They live on the total opposite side of the island and, and they don't want to go here. Because uh, this area was, after World War II, this Japanese occupied this island for a while, then it was American administrated. They wanted to make a national park here. Here's the city itself in the ocean. This is this coral reef they built it on. And then here is this very deep uh, channel. And what we'll see here is that uh, they brought an, an archeologist from Ohio out here and he was supposed to find out like where this city started and where it stopped so they could make like a national park around it. And what he found was that there was stuff underwater here too. So right here, here's an aerial photo. Here you can see the city, the big walls. This is in the ocean. They've made artificial uh, islands and stuff here. It's, now it's a huge swamp, so there's a lot of mangrove trees that have grown over it. It wouldn't have been that like that originally. This is... Here, this uh, coral reef. There's weird tunnels that go in from the coral reef, and they go to some of the islands and stuff like that, and they've put dye in. This is quite deep in here. Now, in this area here, there's huge stone walls. It suddenly goes down to 80, 100 feet deep. And in here are, this guy was saying that, yes, there's this other city. It's down underwater. It's inside this harbor. He had a different name for it called Canemueso. His name is Masao Hadley, he's passed on, but he was the chief of this area of the island and he was the keeper of this city and was the person who kept the secrets. But as you go underwater there, uh, you will find, you, you find big basalt blocks and things like that. You've got, uh, here's basalt crystals. 
they're, I mean, they were using this. They had to throw some of them into the water to create these islands and stuff like that. Uh, some of them weighing up to 100 tons. Here again, more underwater stuff. Here is hard to see. This, this basalt actually had a few glyphs or something in it. There are no, there actually is no writing or, any, or statues or anything that are found there. So down about 80 feet are these columns and they stand up and they're covered with coral. Here you can see one here. You need scuba gear to go down there. They're totally encrusted with coral. But Arthur Sachs, the archeologist who was trying to delineate this whole area, his, what, what he found was that, yeah, there was some alignment of like standing stones, he thought, but they were 80 feet underwater and covered with coral. Here you can see one right here. So this area became as uh, controversial that there, because there certainly are stones and stuff underwater, but, but not thought to be this deep. Here again, these standing stones and, and with the coral and stuff on them. Here we are trying to break some of the coral off, try to get inside to see what kind of stone, in, in theory, kind of things. There's another island right by Ponape. It also has giant walls like this guy. It's also built out of basalt. This is on Kosrai Island. It's not as extensive as Namadal, but it's still pretty big. At Saipan too, Saipan, which is north of all this area, uh, north of Guam. Also huge standing stones like this. Apparently there were, there was giant temples and stuff like that in this area. And even today, these are pretty remote islands, although you're getting kind of closer to Japan with all this. The whole concept of the world grid and certain vortex areas and power points around the world, usually this is based on the Great Pyramid. Ponape is one of these islands where we have that and it, on, the, on this dodecahedron world grid, you have that. There's also, you have this, these underwater ruins at Yonaguni near, near Japan, where the, these look a lot like stuff that's in South America blocks underwater. I've, I, I haven't actually been diving here, I have to admit. But this is what this looked like, these structures. I know Graham Hancock has, has been here, and uh, that the whole area is quite interesting. But Polynesians themselves, they claim that they're from this special place called Hawaii. Not Hawaii, but Hawaii. Like Hiva on Easter Island, Hawaii is this mythical lost land that they're from, and they don't know where it is. It's underwater now, they're claiming. Polyne the archeologists and Polynesians, they're always, they're always looking for Hawaii. And uh, many people, uh, you know, they, they sometimes think it's Reatea. If you go to Samoa, they'll tell you Hawaii's in Samoa. Uh, others will say that Hawaii is, is under the water. Then in Samoa was this guy. He was the Tui Manua of Samoa. He was said, and today this is part of American Samoa, south of Hawaii, he was said to be able to fly, and he was the emperor of the entire Pacific, although the island he lived on was this really small island with obsidian mines in American Samoa. And, whoops, let me go back. Uh, all right, that, my last slide there was the Piri Reese map, and I... Uh, I somehow jumped past it. I don't know what I've done. But that was it. My last slide, that was the last slide. And I, the, my last one was of the Piri Reese map. So that's it for the megaliths of the Pacific. So thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks.